I have a storehouse full of horror stories. I can't give you any happy music because I'm influenced by the ghetto you ruined, the same dude you gave nothing. I made something doing what I do through and through. I give you the news with a twist. It's just my poetic ghetto point of view. Imagine roaches on your stovetop, not being able to leave loaves of bread on the table or the mice will nibble through it. Can't trash the entire loaf on no peanut butter and jelly or turkey and cheese. So best believe we are picking through it. Imagine being given electronic toys without any batteries and are told to have fun. You still wonder why we are frustrated, surrounded by racism and hatred. The rich run around clothed while we lie naked, scraping the skin off the bottom of our feet, walking in cold basements. Imagine granny not being able to pay the gas and electric. Now we fall deep into the crevice of systemic oppression. Imagine wanting to love your mother, but it's impossible because no one taught you to love yourself. And she's in love with the coke eye, like black lungs to a smoke eye. She gets slayed by the busters, her lips locked around pistols and semen behind dumpsters. Imagine cringing at your mother's sight because her face is raw, bone skinny. She looks this close to death, malnourished a ghost. Now you're embracing that dark night when she finally overdosed. The truth is hard to swallow, like biscuits with no water. You call my him spiritual. I call it manic disorder Imagine your baby mother Not letting you see your only daughter And she's demanding a lawyer To receive a quarter of a price That you don't got Just so she can drip gold And rock Gucci Imagine being a young boy Running up to your father on the streets You go and give him a hug On his waist you feel a heat You praying that he doesn't do anything dumb But then you realize where you reside The prayers are cheap since a toddler, I've been seeing brains, guts, and blood get splattered from fast slugs. All credit is due to my economic status. Poor and black equals automatic criminal. In fact, we are padlocked to poverty. This man-made habitat. Nobody wants to kill. We just don't want to die. We don't have the privilege to get out. We don't have Jordan Peele's eyes. So now I'm lost in the world. I've been down my whole life. I'm in a concrete jungle. I'm down on my mind. I was born on the brink when depressed and out of time. I wonder what the Hemingway drink. Vodka, gimlets, and wood tips. They call me by my first name. I'm spinning in a mental prison. This is a cursed chain. Sorry that my daily devotions are grimy and open. The truth couldn't be more potent. This is God's work. This is poetry in motion. I'm birthed a new generation. Look at my stomach, it's poking. Imagine, imagine being dealt the credible cards. We're giving guns to shoot, but it's impossible to shoot for the stars. God, if you're in control like you say you are, then steer us all to your kingdom and make sure that my grandmother dies. You renew her life with eternal youth. She is the black phoenix. Am I a genius? Far from it. Just a writer, a part-time psycho, a boy who wants to reverse time and play with his tight goal. Embrace the way you laugh, look in love. You might be ugly, but guess what? You are beautiful too. Just like the rest of us stuck inside this cubicle glued. Imagine if I told you nobody had the answers. We all abide by geographical rules. This is my news with a twist. It's just my poetic ghetto point of view. Thank you. Today we've come for an amazing dialogue. And you don't know, I've been in the back with uh, these two amazing brothers. Uh, for some of you who come from the music world, you know about the, the bees. The bees is Brahm and Bach and Beethoven. But we've got in Baltimore now two Bs. And those two Bs are Bradford and Bedford. And they are an amazing collaboration of persons. Uh, and I'm so happy I have the opportunity to bring them out. But I want to tell you one other piece about what Union Baptist has done in terms of art. You are now sitting in the main sanctuary that was designed by uh, William Beardsley, Jr. Uh, he, he was an amazing architect of the early 1900s uh, and uh, did a lot of work uh, not only throughout the, uh, 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 Baltimore but uh, in Boston and New York. And uh, he came and helped design our church, which we came to this location in 1905. If you take a scan of the our stained glass windows, they are a work of art as well. These stained glass windows are John Lafarge windows. Uh, very, uh, very uh, significant. John Lafarge was the, uh, the mentor to Louis Tiffany. Uh, he actually developed what is called the opulent stained glass technique. And so these windows that you see are John Lafarge windows. Uh, so I just want to say that this whole idea of art and spirit 
uh, is, uh, is, is embedded in this. But one of the things that we must recognize is that when we begin to talk about the aesthetic, when we begin to talk about beauty, we must also envision a tomorrow. Because tomorrow can be better if we envision it as better. And so we have uh, here, I'm going to bring out right now, two amazing people. You know their names, you know them well. Uh, but they are going to have for us a dialogue and conversation about a pathway envisioning a bright tomorrow. First, I'd like to bring out uh, the uh, director of the Baldwin Museum of Art, uh, Chris Bedford. Uh, please come on out and take your seat. And the other half of our B&B &B combination, I want to present to you Mark Bradford. Please come on out. I would say that one of the wisest decisions that the Baltimore Museum of Art has made, you've made a many, but one that you made that is absolutely amazing is that you brought Chris Bedford to our city. He is a gem. And I must admit, I must have been one of the first persons on his uh, uh, guest list. I knocked on his door just as, literally as soon as he unpacked his bag and came to town. And we begin to envision a collaboration, and that collaboration is what you see today. Uh, he is one of the most brilliant visionaries that I've met. I call him a friend and a colleague, and I present to you now, Chris Bedford. All right, so I couldn't resist the opportunity to get in a pulpit. <laughs> it didn't really occur to me that this would be an opportunity until I entered the church and thought, oh, this is probably a first and a last. So um, thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Reverend Hathaway, for those really humbling remarks. And you were among my first visits in Baltimore, and I have Jim Thornton, who's the vice chair of our board, to thank for making that introduction. I would say without that introduction, we wouldn't be here. So thank you, Reverend Hathaway, and thank you, Jim, if you're in the audience. Um, I want to welcome you on behalf of the BMA to this event, and on behalf of the chair of our board, Claire Zamoski siegel who's sitting next to my wife, Jennifer, and two daughters. Um, thank you all for coming and joining us this evening, or well, this afternoon. Uh, this is the first of three, a sequence of three public discussions that we're going to have across Baltimore. And the, as uh, Reverend Hathaway indicated, the, the objective here is not only to envision but enact new futures. And I think in Mark, you're going to find somebody who is driven to action and has in many locations around the world been able to find ways to change people's lives and I think in the process change his own and certainly mine. Uh, so before I get to the longer introduction of our esteemed speaker and my good friend Mark, I wanted to let you know about a few uh, just housekeeping things. If you guys need to get back to the BMA from here, after the talk we have shuttles running between uh, now and 4 p.m. And so that should make your passage relatively easy. And as I said, this is the first of three public conversations. The second of them will occur on February 24th at a location to be determined uh, and announced and with content that we will announce shortly too. So that's hugely exciting. I, I think that this is going to be a tough act to follow. But I have confidence that our education department will put together something fabulous. Um, so just a few important thank yous. First of all, Gami and Gyo, who is somewhere probably lurking in the back. You should stand up and make yourself known. So uh, these sorts of afternoons don't just happen. Uh, as that's probably very obvious. They happen with a tremendous amount of work. So I want to thank Garmian, who heads our education department, for leading that charge along with her department, and also the museum itself for turning 180 degrees in the direction that we're driving it. And this isn't easy work. It's unconventional work for museums. We're very proud of it, and I'm proud of the staff for pushing that agenda. 
I also want to thank the board, many of whom are here, and specifically the engagement committee, uh, who help us form these sorts of events, formulate them, find sites for um, uh, lectures that happen in unconventional places, and again, have turned a radical corner very quickly in thinking about the kind of work that museums should be doing in a community like Baltimore. So they deserve a resounding round of applause for, for doing this. It goes without saying, Reverend Hathaway, that we're indebted to you, and I'm hopeful that this will be the first of many collaborations between our institution and yours. I think what we're after is a seamless back and forth between our communities. We have not, as a museum, not just this museum, but all museums, done a good job in engaging faith-based communities in the work that we do. So we aim to alter that completely in order to create the Baltimore that we imagine. So thank you for doing this this afternoon. And then, uh, yes, another one. And then, very significantly and finally, I want to thank uh, Sue Cohen, who is sitting there in the third row for making this afternoon possible. So I will say this, and we, I, I said a very similar thing last night at dinner. Uh, before there was the Venice Biennale and the dazzling success of Mark Bradford in the front page of the New York Times and touring exhibitions all over the world, there was just a promise of what we might be able to do. So it seems, I think, really significant to invoke the idea of faith here. Clearly, Sue had tremendous faith in our direction, and um, I think the reason that we're sitting here is her vision and her generosity, so you deserve the biggest round of applause. All right, I'm almost finished with the thank yous. Um, actually, I am finished with the thank yous. I'll, just, I'll save the rest for later and go on to introducing Mark very briefly, a man who truly needs no introduction. But people often ask me, in fact, many times last night, uh, what I envision for the future of the museum, for the Baltimore Museum of Art, what museums I think of as my North Star or gu guiding light. And I have to be honest and say that there are no other museums I look to as an example of what we can become in Baltimore. But I do look to Mark. And not just as an artist, but as a philanthropist, and as somebody who's pioneered a path that binds art to social service. Um, and I think that actually it would be more apposite to reverse that order. And I think this is the most significant thing about the work that Mark does in the public sphere. It's based on need, and he'll talk about this, and access on the other hand. And it always proceeds in that order. So it's impossible to engage a community with deep challenges without first acknowledging and remedying, meeting, and working towards um, creating a platform where those challenges are no longer an impediment to engaging with contemporary ideas. And Mark has taught me the great value of doing that. And what, so when we think about engagement, education, and contemporary ideas in Baltimore, first we think about the communities we want to engage and what might be the impediments to their um, engaging with the work that we do as a museum. And that was all absorbed from Mark, who has founded not-for-profits that are still sustaining and sustainable in New Orleans, Los Angeles, Venice, Italy. And you all saw, yeah, incredible. Um, and you all saw yesterday his partnership emerging with Green Mount West Community Center. Two of representatives from there are here with us this afternoon, and one of whom will be on the stage later, and you'll hear more about that partnership. But we can imagine a sustainable future there, too, a collision of art, social justice, and social service. So without Mark's inspiration, I don't think any of these things would be possible. So that puts him in the category of one. Add to that the fact Add to that the fact that he is also, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, the greatest living abstract painter, who's won every award there is in the art world, including a MacArthur Fellowship, and has represented the United States in Venice, then I think you have a generational talent, the likes of which we're not likely to see again. So. <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm really going for it this time, Mark. So um, that said, I don't think even if you put those two parts together, you get the whole of Mark. Um, so it's my pleasure that we actually do get the whole of Mark, and you can hear from him now. So please welcome Mark Bradford. Well, I'm not getting on the pulpit. I'll just, I'll just sit here. Bob, this is loud. Um, uh, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so. You know, looking around the church house, um, I mean, it's been a minute, but, uh, but as my grandmother says, you, you carry your church with you. <laughs> um, and, but 
When Chris was talking to me about doing something, I thought, well, if we're going to ask different questions, well, we need to kind of change the location to um, have a different experience. And I think that by just putting it here and in this context and in this history, I think that the conversation will animate in a different way. It's all an experiment for me. Um, Don't mind me, I'm just putting up slides for a second. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm charged with operating the technology, which was probably a fatal flaw. Um, so I wanted to ask you a leading question, a couple of leading questions, and then just let you, let you loose. Um, it's obviously we're sitting in a church speaking. Um, we're not sitting in the auditorium at the BMA. Yeah. We're not sitting in an art school. Mm -hmm. We're not sitting in a lecture hall. We're not sitting in a corporate center. We're sitting in a church very deliberately. Yeah. So why is that? Why are we here? Because I wanted, I wanted to give a different audience access to it, like locally, that like they could walk here. The, the idea that there are certain people that when they come to the BMA, they're uncomfortable and that they have to park somewhere and navigate and, and, and kind of get into an uncomfortable space. But then when they get inside, we're asking them to be comfortable and, and, and be welcomed. Well, if you reverse it around and you have people that maybe would be more, uncomfort more comfortable going to the BMA and they have to park closer to here and navigate and maybe come in, and we want them to feel comfortable. So it's always just trying to find new ways to activate a conversation. For me, that's always, that's always my thing. And you sometimes have to change the location for those conversations to have, happen. My hope is that somebody walking down the street can walk in and see something. If you can't see it, you can't dream it. And we can't always ask, especially when it comes to art, you can't always ask young people to get in a bus and go across town and point to something that's art. So I just thought, well, I know the church house. <laughs> I know the church house. So this obviously relates back to your origins, and we talked about this a little bit in advance. I think one of the best ways to enter a discussion about you and about abstraction and the way that you forge your path is by narrating some of that story, which mm. is not conventional. I mean, you, you've now, we joke, achieved the mountaintop in almost every respect, but you didn't begin at the mountaintop, let's say. Really? And, <laughs> and, the, and the interview that you and I did for the Venice Biennale catalog attests to that, and we have yeah. some slides up. Oh, that, yeah, that's where I grew up, y'all. That, context, that the contextualized shop, the yeah. beginning. Yeah. So, the beauty shop. I, I, my mom was a beauty operator. I was a hairdresser. Those are old school words. I wasn't a stylist. I wasn't a stylist. So my mother was an orphan, and she came from Philadelphia, moved to Los Angeles, and um, moved into a boarding house. And that's basically where I was. I lived until I was 11 years old. So basically, I lived in a room with my mother, and Mama and Papa would rent rooms to other women with their children. And it was really interesting because it was almost communal, completely matriarchal, but really communal. And then Mama and Papa, who owned the boarding house, would watch all the kids while all of the women would work all day and go to school all night my mom being one of them. So I really didn't see my mother much, but it was like a, we had an extended family, and that was, it wasn't that uncommon. People make so much uh, a big deal of it now, but in the 70s, there were a lot of African-American people that would rent rooms. I mean, so that wasn't that uncommon. Um, and that was, our, that was our first beauty shop, and that's actually a, a client named Raymond, and I was giving him a jerry curl, and that was the 80s. Yes. Well, I was given a jerry curl. Um, but what, and I didn't have a father, so it was me and my mom. We were always merchants. So next door to that, my mom's hair salon, which was Foxy Coiffure, there was a man from Kenya who sold kind of mer merchandise from Kenya next door to a Mexican family that sold mattresses. And on the corner, it was a Chinese family that sold secondhand um, uh, televisions. So mercantile and race and all that and, and um, gender roles were all kind of collapsed in my thinking. Now I would go to school and then after school I would go right to the beauty shop. That was a real raggedy day. It was cleaner than that sometime. <laughs> um, and I would uh, do my work, do my homework. I'd have little, uh, I, my mother never cooked so I had like, I could go to all the soul food restaurants around and, and, and um, I had like a, 
you know, like a, a charge. I could charge, and at the end of the month, I had a tab. And at the end of the, one, the month, my mom would go in and pay everybody. And that really was my life. That really was my life. And so, and that's my mother, that's Janice, and that's Lynette. And, the, and that is, Lynette is a friend of mine still to this very day. And that was, Lynette was maybe 11 years old. I was telling Chris earlier, I don't edit anything. I don't edit, I don't edit my life, I add things. But I don't self-edit, I don't say, well, this part is for that and that part's for that. Uh, that's, yeah, that's still on Washington and Western. My mom is, we look so much alike, don't we? <laughs> you can tell I'm her son. Um, those are the, yes, you can look around, there's some Jerry, Jerry Activator and Jerry Curl stuff. <laughs> You can so tell that this is the 80s. <laughs> Cause, um, and yes, I had a Jerry oh, Curl. Now that's that. me. Now that's me in, now that's when I was in uh, community college. I had kind of decided that I was gonna start going back to school. And that meant, because between 18 and 27, I did not, I, I, scholastically I fell through the, 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 the I was, but maybe just to, just to interject there for a second, between 18 and 27, I mean, those were vital years in lots of ways. I mean, you made certain decisions to preserve yourself in the face of, you know, a lot of AIDS. threat and danger. He's talking about AIDS. He's like yeah. getting all around in AIDS. Mm. So, 1981, the Jerry Curl hit and also AIDS hit. And so for me, being 18 years old and not knowing how to process any of this information, I didn't know how to be 20 years old and have 75% of the people that I know die. I, it was just too early for me. And at the same time, this was 1981, 1982, I'd never heard of crack cocaine. Crack cocaine was happening, um, drive-by shootings, um, the rise of so much that I, as 20, and I couldn't process it all. So I fled, I, got, I sold my car for $800, I put $400 in my backpack and I went to Europe. And I just traveled around, I was kind of haunted and yet basically I worked in nightclubs because that's what I knew how to do. I worked in nightclubs in LA. I, I, so after, since I didn't go the educational route, I just kind of went to the streets. I was not that much into drugs, but I was just more into, um, I was just looking for other people that were just kind of, had fallen through the cracks too, and then oftentimes you find little people in nightclubs. So I was very much a nightclub person. And uh, that's between LA, New York, Paris, London. I just travel and I come back to the hair salon, I curl hair for a little bit and then go back and then go back on the road and come back and curl hair for a little bit. But and essentially was, you were earning money in Los Angeles and then traveling to Europe. I was, I was, and that's Carol. And Carol sits on the board of my nonprofit. I know her to this very day. Um, and that was me, that was when I was about 27 years old. So when you really talk about, I'm gonna try to get myself together, um, that's a big statement, but I had to go back and start, because um, I graduated from a, what you call a bad kids high school, so I had to get my math up, I had to get my English up, and I was kind of embarrassed, you know, I was embarrassed, not because of who I, who I felt I was, but I was embarrassed because I got so tired of people telling me what I should have done at 18. Well, clearly I didn't do it. So I need to keep hearing them say, well, didn't you know, didn't you know? Well, no, I didn't know. I didn't know, I got tired of that. I got tired of people always telling me, well, you should have known that. Well, I didn't. So um, I was in class with 18 year olds and I was 28, but I had to just kind of figure it out. And um, I was still, I, I, you know, I curled my way through undergrad and I curled my way through grad school. <laughs> And I still actually worked in the hair salon when I got a master's degree. I went back to the hair salon and kept working because for me that was a viable thing to do. I never saw a difference. Now this is interesting. So that was the hair salon. Um, keep going one more slide. I'm gonna show you the last, keep going, keep going. Is there a, is there a image on the outside? Go back. I think it's way back, but keep going. going. I'll find it. There. So that was Foxy Hair, that was the last hair salon. We, got about, we had about four hair salons, and we never would buy that building, so whenever someone would buy the building, we would have to move. So we were constantly moving. It was kind of this thing, we never really invested. We just kind of were um, temporary. And the last, this last building, I, I bought. I said, now look, Mom, we gotta, you know, enough. So I bought this building, and actually after, this was my studio for some years, and then it became the, the, the foundation that I have in, in Lamert Park. And go one further, go, you can just keep going. 
Now that's interesting, that was the hair salon and now that's the job lab for um, the foster youth that we work with. And this is interesting is this is the um, permanent exhibition space, but that's, that is across the street from the, um, the hair salon that I used to own. And I used to run across the street to buy products all the time and I would just kind of lean against the counter and kind of eat my lunch and talk to her at the same time and, and, and get a bag of hair, a couple bags of hair, you know, <laughs> two or three bags of hair, some grease and whatever. And <laughs> she's laughing because you know all about that. Um, and then that became the permanent uh, exhibition space of the nonprofit. I can show you what it looks like now. And that's what it looks like. And then, so here we are. And, and sort of like, why? So like, why, why is that important to me? Why that's important to me is access. And why does access, and it should be local. And it can be contemporary. And what if I would have found that early? What if I could have walked into that space when I was nine years old? So just to pivot towards art here for a second. So you spend from when you're 18 to 27 going back and forth to Europe. You're not going to very many museums at that point. Museums are not a huge focus uh, for you. Yeah. <laughs> no. But, no. But, but, but when you're 27, 28, you decide, despite the fact that you weren't as conventionally trained as others entering art school, that art school was your course. And I, you know I've asked this question a million times. But what, can you quantify in any way why that was the path you took? Because we're sitting here looking at a gallery that could be in Chelsea, New York. It's perfectly finished. It has polished concrete floors. It has towering white walls. And on the walls are paintings by Al Loving, which I'll just take a moment to say are currently on view at the BMA, an exhibition that Katie Siegel and I co-organized that Absolutely. first was shown at Art and Practice in Los Angeles is currently on view in the, at the BMA. Just a moment of PR. <laughs> but it's significant that you've completely reconstructed this space in a different vision, that there are these extraordinarily important works of abstract art that have been neglected for years um, and are now on view for a completely different community in Lamert Park. So you brought that to that neighborhood. Without you, it would have been impossible, unimaginable. But why art? Why at 27, 28 did you decide that that was your path? Because it's a space where you can dream. And it's a space where you can have possibility. And it doesn't, and it, and it doesn't, it's, um, for me, when I was about six or seven years old, I was deemed a sissy. I, would, I had to kind of, uh, I, I felt like me, but there was something that, that, but obviously who I was was troubling to other people. It wasn't troubling to me. So uh, what I understand is that I was just, what I understand is that I was just creative and sensitive and I was looking at things maybe a different way. And there wasn't enough space for that type of energy. So for me, I, had, I became really probably self-conscious, defensive, and trying to figure out how to get across the schoolyard. That wasn't, and so how do you develop spaces for different types of um, personalities in the, same, in the same discourse, in the same area, in the same hood? So this is all me before I got to art school. I mean, I, I wanted to create that space. And you graduate from art school, Cal Arts, which is a place that strenuously discouraged painting mm -hmm. and strenuously encouraged a theoretical approach mm -hmm. to art, which you, can, which you absorb but completely disavowed as your path, mm -hmm. which I am always struck by because it was a way of, at that time in Los Angeles, it was a way of inculcating a younger generation of emerging artists. That you were supposed to be a mind, you're supposed to be cerebral, you're supposed to produce non-objective sort of objective work, yeah. but you went in a completely and utterly different direction. Well, I was doing me. I mean, I, 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 I never, as long as being an artist, I had got, before I became an artist, I was so used to people judging me and moving on and doing me anyway. That by the time I got to be an artist, it was old hat. Oh, you know, I don't approve of you. Psh, well, get in line. I, mean, <laughs> 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 I never let that stop me, get in line. I, mean, I got that when I was seven, eight, 10, 12, you name it. So I got kind of used to kind of deciding what something makes sense for me in doing it. And so by the time I got to art school and some things I did were popular and some things I didn't were popular, 
I, as long as I was interested, it never bothered me. Like I said to a total young lady the other day, what, you know, what people think of you is none of your business. And I kept that very deep inside of me. So, and it, when people call me names, and they do, I always realize that they need that. I don't need that name, they need that. So, I was the same way in art school. I, 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 do, what, I do what works for me. And I, I kind of always have. And so, uh, uh, there's a very memorable... Well, I've, taken, I've taken the knocks for that. Too. Oh, for, without question, say, I, without question. Yeah, you know, that's do, happened. You know, fine, do a little... Learn how to fight. Yeah, yeah, right. Sure. Well, there's a very memorable line, a couple of memorable lines you used with me, you being chased through the street, yeah, coming back from school, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe found yourself on the ground, and your sister saying to you, you're going to have to get back up again. You know, I have to, you're going to have to figure out something. Right. Yeah, but that, that kind of... It's, it's not a new story. When people identify people that look a little bit different, or act a little bit different, it makes the pack a little bit uncomfortable. And oftentimes, they separate them a little bit from the pack and say, good luck, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't think that that's, um, I was one of those good luck, you're on your own. So me creating these kind of spaces, the, what I call more gentle spaces, or I mean, you know, it's good luck, you're on your own, and maybe the, those people can find those spaces. Mm -hmm. This is all art and practice, and a lot of things that I do was marked before I got to art school, creating these spaces so that if the pack separates you, we can create these kind of alternative spaces where they can, they're not part of that group, but they can be part of that group. But still, a lot of that culture prevails, and you were sharing this last night. You've created this safe space for people to have creative ideas and to see the creativity of other people reflected for them on a dazzling white wall, but you still get called names in Lamert Park. Well, sure. I'm not, yeah. It's not like the, the word faggot's going to go anywhere. I mean, but it, I don't internalize that. I don't, inter I don't internalize that. Other people need that. Mm -hmm. I know what I need. Name calling is not, it's not something that I really respond to that much. I mean, I know who I am, but um, I think it's important to understand that um, violence is still prevalent in many communities towards certain bodies. And that is something that I'm super interested. I, I talk about that in my work a lot. I talk that in things. I think that I don't think that that's something that would necessarily go away over time. Women, black women, they, I mean, there's all kinds of people and the relationship to their body and the relationship to personal space. Mm -hmm. When does your body belong to you? Mm -hmm. You know, and me being six foot eight and, and, and black, it's, I grew to be six foot eight at, at 15. And I was still very shy, but I was six foot eight. So therefore, almost like uh, childhood was over. It's like you're six foot eight. It's like when a young girl, she's only 13 and she develops really quickly. She's still 13. So this idea, like when does your body belong to the public? When does it belong to you? When, when, when are you allowed to, to, to make that space? And that was something that was, it was hard for me. It was hard for me because I had the body that was supposed to play sports, but I had the sensitivity probably, I guess, of an artist. So we're gonna go back to the timeline for one second. Mm -hmm. So um, you graduate from CalArts, you have an MFA, and you had heard the reputation about the school, the CalArts Mafia. So you graduate with that degree, I and you're just going straight into the art world, and you're gonna be an enormous success. No, I don't think But that, that just didn't, but that didn't work that way I for never, you. I never thought about that. And you went back to the beauty salon. Yeah, I went back to the beauty salon. You know, I went back to working in the hair salon, and I figured I'd figure something out. I never, I never, uh, um, I, I never expected anything from the, from the world. I never expected anyone to take care of me. I saw my mother taking care of herself. My mother would, um, and I grew up in a hair salon, so I saw so many women I grew up with so many women that did not expect anyone to take care of them. My mother never, she would fall down and she figured out a way to get back up. She never looked around for somebody to help her. So I just kind of emulated what I saw. So I never expected anyone to help me. I just expected that I had through hard work and through figuring it out that something might happen and if it doesn't happen, well that would be okay too. I'd figure out a way to get, own beauty shops and three beauty shops or something. I never lamented that something didn't happen for me because from about nine months 
until I left the beauty shop, which was like 40, 45 years old, it was completely matriarchal. And one thing I never, ever heard, and I saw women all day, all night, every day, I never heard anyone say, why me? They cry, they, you know, cry at the shampoo bowl, cry when I'm pressing the hair, and I have to press it again because they cry, sweating out the press. Half of you guys know what I'm talking about. The other half is like sweating out the press. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, well, if you're going to sweat out the press, you're going to press it for free, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I never heard that, so I emulated that. I emulated that. So when I fell down, I just thought, oh, I just get up. And so in school, um, I would listen to the women in the hair salon talk about kind of un the things, it would be unfair on the job or it would be unfair at home and I would watch how they would navigate. So I just kind of did it like they did. So when I was out, it, I just never, uh, I just kind of kept following the same storyline, I suppose. So, but then something did happen for you and the big, probably the biggest break was Freestyle, Freestyle yeah. Thelma Golden and the creation of a painting, Enter and Exit the New Negro. Mm -hmm. So to transition just slight, well maybe not, maybe not, this isn't a transition at all, maybe we talk about life, we talk about your life, the beauty salon, the materials of that space, mm -hmm. the matriarchy and the creation of the painting, mm -hmm. Enter and Exit the New Negro, because I think it binds everything. Well, you make it sound real nice, but I owed $100,000 to CalArts when I got out. Okay, I had, I mean, I, what, $100,000, you might as well say a million dollars. Um, I lived in a, a, pace, a place, I paid $400, I could ride my bike to the hair salon, which is about 15 minutes away. I had a studio and I was broke. So how do you make work and you're broke? So I was like, hmm. All I knew was I worked in a hair salon and the little bit of money that I had, I would pay, I'd buy materials to do the perms and the, you know, the cellophanes because that's how I made my money. So I started looking at that material. What could I use? What could I use? What could I use? What could I use? And that's where it really came from, using this, these permanent wave end papers. But I like that because it talked about history, it talked about culture, it talked about where I was from. It talked without me talking. Because you know, when I got out of school, let me see, I was 40 years old, started making work, I had a lot of history. Know if I was really ready to put my business out in the streets. You know, I was like, no, wait a minute now. Hold up. So I kind of started slow. I kind of started slow and with abstraction and deciding what I was going to reveal in my time. But the materials, I think, spoke of where I was from before I even spoke about it. So we're going to return when Katie gets up here and chats with us to that subject of revelation and what you're willing to reveal, because I think that's really key to the experience of the Venice Biennale. But just to, to go back to your timeline again for a second, I mean, you make this painting, exit, Enter and Exit the New Negro. It's permanent wave end papers. And from that moment onwards, really, you've painted with paper. And I always say to student groups, that sounds so straightforward. Mark has found a way to paint with paper. He's elbowed his way to the table of abstraction. He now sits with the big boys, and it's all self-evident. But how in the world did you decide that you were going to use paper for the purpose of painting? I didn't, you know, you make it sound like, it's too, like, it wasn't like that. I, at first, it was like, I had this material that was tissue paper. I liked it. I liked that you really had to work for the surface. And then, um, I like the tactile of it, and I like that it came from the world. I like that it didn't come from the art store, and I kind of like that. I like how you build up the canvas one increment at a time. I like that. Just, I, the material, I had, to, I had to work. I had to work it. I had to will it into something else. And I think that came from the hair salon. I do. Because when you wash African-American hair, it, it, it sure is not looking like China silk. And if they want China silk, you gotta really work with, you know, you gotta work with like part Africa, part China. But if that's what the client wants, so I'm used to willing something, like taking it from one set of things to another, if that's what they want. Like willing it, I think I willed myself. Uh, just because you're born in one, 
one place doesn't mean that you have to stay there. Willing, I, I think desire. I wanted to take this material that comes from the streets or take this material that comes from something that's not used for art and will demand that it, it becomes something that I decide that it is. And just because I have to work hard doesn't mean that I don't do it. I'm sure it's some psychological narrative I set up for myself about how I had to will myself, but it works for me. I like that grind. I like to work hard to push. And I still, I kind of still do that. I mean, and, and to this day, this studio is an enormous work-based enterprise. I mean, there are, you work really hard. You work six days a week, I do. invariably, unless you're traveling and going to galas, celebrating you across the United States and giving talks in churches. Mm. You're in the studio working, grinding away at those paintings. And that seems to me, and uh, Casey and I were talking about this at some point last week, but the idea of the phrase that Jack Whitten uses, he doesn't paint, he makes. I always think about this, the difference between the two. It's the go-to thing for me. The only way I've ever known how to get out of a situation is to work. I mean, I've gotten myself in a bad situation before in my life. I've done things in my life. And the only thing I know how to do is just keep, keep working, keep pushing, keep moving. And so at the, at the, that momentum is, is the thing that I've carried through. And these aren't things that I learned from being an artist. These are things I learned from like being six years old. You just gotta keep pushing. You gotta keep moving. Tomorrow will be, just keep. So if I'm trying to figure out something in, in art, I just know I have to go to work and I'll figure it out. I won't go, the longer I sit, I just kinda get nervous and hysterical and scared. So I just get up and get pushing. Mm -hmm. That's I just always done. I would tell my girlfriends, come on girl, let's just get up, come on, come on. You're doing too much, let's get up, come on. Let's, let's, let's paint some walls, paint the walls. Or something. I used to do that a lot. Here's an interesting thing about me, the heart. I would always paint walls, which is funny. Like something would happen or, and I would go and pull all my furniture out and paint all the walls. I'd paint them like, I thought a fresh coat of paint would like be a fresh start or something. I was constantly <laughs> painting walls. <laughs> my walls, something happened to a girlfriend. I was always painting somebody's walls. Very funny, <laughs> and a story I hadn't heard. So, and you said last night we were just casually talking about painting, and I think you were talking to Amy Sherald, who might or may not be here, and you, you, I mean, it was late in the evening, you said, do you ever, ever have the feeling that once you've completed the painting, it's gonna be the last one, that this is just, there is no way that you can make anything as good ever again, but yet you begin again every single time. Um, I feel that every time I finish a painting, I feel like, well, better go back to the hair salon. This is it. <laughs> Give me a couple salons. Yeah, I feel that every single time I finish a work. I feel every single time I finish a painting, I think that's the last painting. And then I show up the next day. And believe me, I am not, you know, I don't work when I'm just inspired. I don't work when I just feel it. I just work every day. Nervous, depressed, elated, happy, all the, I don't I work. I work through whatever it is I'm going through, constantly. But that's what I, that's what I grew up seeing. Whatever they, whatever was going, and you can kind of see when people are going through things, but they still show up at their jobs, they show up at their, their friends, they show up whatever. But you can see, you can see. So I would just go to work. I just go to work. I, I will go to work Monday. So, seventeen years after freestyle, and working, working, working with paper principally in both three dimensions and two dimensions, you arrive at the Venice Biennale. And uh, we submitted an application. Um, no, you said you didn't think we were going to get it. No. I, will, on the other hand, was certain we would. <laughs> so. Aries. Aries always think you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Aries. <laughs> um, no, no. I mean, like, you know, here's the thing. Like, I, I get it. I use all the big words this and that, I don't think that way. I just don't think that way. I just, I'm very head to the ground. Let me go from one to two to three to four. I don't, when you said, oh, Mark, we're gonna propose you for the event, I was like, whatever. You know, I got two or three paintings to finish. I just don't think like that. I just don't. I just, maybe low self-esteem, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just think about what's ahead of me. What's, what's the next thing ahead of me? Like, and I don't know, maybe that, that 
you know, I've worked in the hair salon 20 years, and if you have 20, if you have 10 clients in, in the salon, that client just wants you to focus on them. Like Keisha wants me to talk to Keisha. Don't be talking, you know, the other women down there, you give me all. So I think with me, I translated that when I'm working on paintings. I just work on the one th event, and the next event, and the next event. And you talked about Venice. I was like, I had, no, too many clients before Venice. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's a very basic way of thinking, but I think it came from being a merchant in some ways of how I think about things. So since we've landed on Venice, I'm going to take the opportunity to invite Katie Siegel to the stage, who's getting ready to make her way up here. Sorry for the awkward transition. So um, Katie is the co-curator in Venice. Um, she and I have worked together for a long time. No. No, you it's just all about you. No. Exactly. I'm never nervous when I'm on stage with Mark. It's perfect. Um, so Katie is our senior curator for programming and research at the BMA. She's responsible for too many exhibitions to count and worked in lockstep with um, Mark and I on the gestation and production of this incredible exhibition. So um, I have some nice slides that I can advance for you. Um, so following on from the discussion about working, maybe we can begin with a discussion of this pavilion as a workplace. It looks like a work site. Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> um, OK, so when you get this Venice, and for me, there was so much going on in the country, so much going on in my head that kind of went from Obama to Trump. For me, it just felt like a ruin. And so what I did was I started working in front of the pavilion, and I kind of brought a lot of sand and a lot of stuff and almost made it look like a, an archaeological site. And I worked out in front for about, mm, 30, about, two, about a month or two. And then I just decided to leave it. I decided I wasn't going to make a presentation on the outside. I was going to make it look like it was an abandoned work site. Because in some ways, that's kind of how I was feeling about what was going on, is just that it was almost like the collapse of something. So that's what it looks like on the outside. It looks like, you know, when you go to like certain parts of the community and it's all just boarded up and it's gone, there's nobody there. And um, I actually built the pavilion in my, I rented a space that was really big, about twice as big as this, and I built the pavilion and, um, as a, like a model. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because when you get those type of honors, it almost feels like you're, you're like representing the White House or something, and it's so tight. Everything's so tight, I can't play, I can't laugh, I can't have a joke. So what I did was I built my own pavilion and then I started having fun in it. I would like have, I'd do little videos of me crawling in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Some of which I have, to be I honest. <laughs> but what I did was I made, it, I, I made it human. I made it human. Because for me, I don't feel that much different than when I got out of grad school. I don't feel, I'm not going to let anybody take away that flexibility that I have. So by building it, I started making it my own. And that, that building carries a lot of weight with it. I mean, when you show up, it looks like the White House. It looks, it's based on Monticello. It's like the Disney World version of, of Monticello in those national pavilions. So that felt like a lot of, that felt heavy to start with. It did. And Monticello, you know, being Thomas Jefferson's plantation. Um, when I walked up, I just had a very kind of like, oh, I just don't like, I just don't like the building at all. I mean, that instantly I was like, oh, it just feels like a plantation. And you know, I kept thinking out of all the architectural styles they could have done for the U.S. pavilion, why that one? Like, I just, I don't know, like, why that one? Why choose that one? But okay, anyway, uh, that was the 20s, right? It was, when it was constructed, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and that's sort of where the title for the Pro whole project started. Yeah. Do you want to tell everybody where that? Tomorrow's another day is the last line of Gone with the Wind. And me being, um, and Gone with the Wind um, is one of the most beloved movies um, still, but for me, it's, it's, it's a troubling uh, movie because of, of so many of the stereotypes, especially of African American people, that you still see that we struggle with today. And so that, it's, it's such a troubling movie, but it's a beloved movie. And um, so it starts with a poem. It starts about, um, uh, there's a poem, 
there's a god, Hephaestus, and he wasn't perfect, and he got pushed out of Mount, Olymp Mount Olympus for not being perfect. And I think I respond a little bit to being pushed out because of something that's not perfect and having to wander a landscape. So just for clarity, this is a poem that Mark wrote, which is essentially an interpretive text for the US Pavilion. And I, I talk about this all the time when I give tours. I don't know of an, another person who's only written one poem in their life. That poem is then etched into concrete, installed on the outside of the US Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, and read by millions of people. <laughs> so, so that was your first. <laughs> so that was your first foray into poetry. Um, and, it was the first time I let people read, read it. it. Yeah. Um, I think the, the fact that it's the first time you let people read it is like em emblematic of a decision that you made overall for Venice, which is to say, okay, yeah, this is I who did. I am. Yeah, I did. I, I, I kind of have to admit, I was a little more open by the time I got to Venice. I was, I was you know, letting the business show. I mean, I had, obviously it would show, but I kind of just let it, I think it was, I just, I had this moment where I felt like such a collapse and it reminded me of like the early 80s when everything, especially with HIV and the, the kind of collapse of a social and cultural center, and I just couldn't find my, my grounding, and I was having that on the national kind of conversation that we were having now, this kind of feeling. So to me, they kind of collapsed onto each other. Oh, and that's the first. So maybe you could just walk us through the galleries and how it functions as a narrative. So you walk in and that spoiled foot, and that is the collapse. It's like a fissure, it's like a, a disease center that kind of, um, that you have to navigate around. And the, no, the center has collapsed, that there's no center, that you have to, that you're pushed to the peripheral. And that's me trying to figure out in the studio how to make it, so I kind of wanted to show you that too. Um, that's another, sometimes I'll make things two and three, four times before I actually present it. But that's how it looks in the encasing in my studio. And that's up close. I take a lot of billboards from the streets and make it, but this also looks like um, pustules and something that's dis-ease, where disease comes from. Um, and that's the, that's the casing for it. And so this, the second room is called like the Medusa room. And if you look at the paintings, these were made by the end papers from the, the, the hair salon these kind of two by two rectangulars that I made kind of, and it's interesting though, when I first started making work for the, for the show, I went all the way back to kind of home. I think that was a way of grounding myself a little bit. And uh, this Medusa sculpture was almost like, um, because Medusa was this fierce person that would turn men to stone. And I kind of thought every woman was Medusa growing up. You know, I thought they were all fierce and like they were just, and so for me, they never, Medusa never got her head chopped off. Like she never, it never happened. They were just fierce. I mean, I just, that's all I ever saw was just fierce women. I was in the hair salon as a kid, just like, wow, all right, you know. That's all I ever saw. So Medusa, I remember always had this, this um, I was always fascinated by why she was angry. Like what made her so angry? Not like, we wanna talk about like, what is it, Perseus, who chops off her head with a mirror? I was thinking, well, she would be way smarter than that. Like, <laughs> it's totally like a man figuring that out. So um, I made these paintings in this room, and these are, um, that kind of rotates around that idea of a, sti a still surface and underneath this kind of rage. That, that was kind of me. I kind of learned how to be very still on the outside, where I had a lot of rage underneath. And that was true. I mean, that was true. And I think that that definitely came from being a little kid and, and having my voice so suppressed that I, I had to learn to navigate and be silent, but there was this kind of anger underneath. I'm sure. And so I turned that into this room that had this kind of still waters run deep. So the middle of the room for me was this middle passage and I began to think about what, you know what fascinated me was, where would, um, I thought the Monticello and I thought of, 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 a, of a slave plantation, where would the slaves go to, to take their pain? Like um, where would they go to take their weight, their rage? So this became like a grotto, something that you would, that, that they would dig out underneath almost the slave cabins. I have an active imagination, I can kind of go there. 
And it became very um, like a cave. And, but, it, but I used all the paper to, I wanted to choke the architecture a little bit, whereas this is kind of a reverent architecture where it kind of brings you up. That one I wanted to kind of strangle, and kind of strangle it. And so you go into the fourth room and it's, it's painting, it really is painting and still with paper, you know, 20 years later it's still with paper and it still has the things that I'm interested in, this kind of uh, having to make, force it into, will it into this kind of conversation. And um, it's called Go Tell It on the Mountain. And, uh, tomorrow is another day. That, yeah, tomorrow's another day. I forget sometimes. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the surface of these paintings, um, the kind of paper you use, the use of bleach, the use of sanders, no. how they're actually forged. So every one of those circles basically is a half dome that I sand down really, really flat. So you have to think of it as being very, very big and very, very sculptural. Um, they're very cellular. This body of work is very cellular. I think I was really thinking about the architecture of the body. I was probably thinking about even the early 80s when um, something would enter into the architecture of the body and destroy it. It's a it's foreign thing, but that's the same thing with any type of disease. And so I was using that cellular pa pattern still to talk about that. Vo um, the body and vulnerability from external or internal. Um, and the same thing you can look and see the last room, um, there's a young man that walks in front of my studio, his name is Melvin, and he walks down the street. And uh, Melvin owns that street like it's a runway, owns it. And what the dichotomy, which is really interesting, is that body in that sort of uh, place, the possibility of something bad happening to that body or something good happening to that body. And that's, again, something that I'm interested in. I talked about that earlier. I talked about that all, all, all bodies are not equal in public space and that the idea of danger towards certain bodies, for no transgression of their own, it's other people looking in. You turn, um, a young man turns down a street that's unfamiliar and that body is unfamiliar, therefore that body has the possibility of something violently happening. And so that is what I was fascinated by Melvin. So I just told him one day, I was like, I just wanna film you walking down the street. And of course, when we're filming, you know, people would bag it, you know? And I was like, wow, like they pick up on certain things, even just us doing this. And you realize that there's a possibility of danger. But there's a strength also in what's happening there. There's a strength in that body also. It's not all, it's just possibility and in public space. And that's what I wanted to end with is that tomorrow always is another day. We take our fragileness and our vulnerabilities and our strength with us as we move out into whatever we're going to do. And that is fundamentally what I believe. Um. So in the interests of time, I am going to transition us from the work you produced for the pavilion to the work that you did with the not-for-profit Rio Terra. And so if you give me a second, I'm going to queue up the film. It might take a moment. We'll allow the audience to see that and have a brief discussion about your collaboration with that not-for-profit. Reasonable? You guys can talk among yourselves. I will just say, I'm just going to vamp here for a minute, that you'll see when the work comes to Baltimore, which it will very soon, that those paintings are just astonishing accomplishments in, in person. And the Baltimore Museum um, was responsible for, for presenting the Venice Biennale 60 years ago, um, and it was the landmark statement about abstract painting, an American, the American role in abstract painting. And when you see um, Mark's work, you'll see that it is the most um, important revival of that work and voice in that, in that mode and that it's a black American doing it 60 years later um, instead of four white men is just tremendously moving and it has all the depth that Mark really talk, has just talked us through um, is there in the work. And in addition to that, he also does this. So I'm hoping this movie is going to play. Where things 
start does not always determine where they end up. And that's something that I'm very much interested in. I'm not interested in the base metals. I'm interested in the desire of that mad scientist to turn them into gold. And gold looks very different for every single person. And every person has a different desire. And therein lies a hope that no matter where something comes from, it can have a different conversation. It's the same with people. Where we begin isn't necessarily where we have to end up. The one on the right, he's fine, he'll be all right. He's representing the United States in Venice being out. But that other little kid, I was living in mainstream America, in schools, scared, not fitting in, totally different. Man, if I could have met a me saying, you'll be fine, could have made the whole lot of difference. But it's just like, there are no alternatives within that site. So we got to make that site. What do you want to be, little man? You want to be an artist? All right. When Alan, myself, and Eileen were thinking about starting a foundation, we had a conversations about how much our lives had changed from where we came from. And that was very important to all three of us to embed possibility into the foundation. Art and Practice started as an idea over 10 years ago. And the idea was to bring something that would help the community where Mark's mother and he had had a hair salon on Lamert Boulevard. It happened very organically. Every day I would go to the store or go pick up supplies right outside of my studio and I would notice a large number of young people. And so I would just strike up conversations and I found that my studio sat right in the middle of the highest density of foster youth. So that was really a need that was staring me in the face and so I knew that when we talked about starting the foundation that I wanted to address this need. We collaborated with museums to bring museum curated art into the space and with First Place for Youth, who was able to help these kids get their GED, find housing, and have their health care issues. Contemporary ideas circulate in a, pretty, uh, in a working class, predominantly black neighborhood. So contemporary ideas are only functioning in a middle to upper class environment. How is that going to change a larger landscape? I wanted to stand on both of my legs when I was in Venice. I knew that I just could not do the pavilion. I was not comfortable just doing the pavilion. I knew I, I had to have both of my legs, and, and I would just kind of wander around and ask people, oh, what's this, and have you heard about that? But eventually, I came upon something that I was very interested in. When you think of Venice, you do not think of a women's prison. And I was like, ooh, this totally works for me. And I found that other leg. There's 12 cooperatives all throughout Italy, in prisons, stepping in and fulfilling a need. How the project came to construct itself was that I did a lot of listening, and they told me what they needed. Mega literature is tanta, tante persone che sono molto negative. Il lavoro in galera è molto importante perché ce l'hai, c'è un'occupazione che che ti aiuta mentalmente, più positiva alla vita. Quando sono entrata in questa esperienza sono diventata detenuta. Diciamo che mi è crollato il mondo addosso. Avere l'opportunità di lavorare è importantissimo perché sei in mezzo a persone che ti trattano con umanità. Dimostrare a se stessi e agli altri di avere delle capacità, la capacità di fare una cosa e di farla bene, è quello che fa avere orgoglio a una persona e quella che la fa andare avanti che cosa hanno fatto, la ragione per cui sono lì, se non è strettamente necessario o per qualche ragione particolare. E sono, però sono loro che lo raccontano, sono loro che a un certo punto arrivano e ti raccontano la loro storia e a volte il nodo alla gola arriva, perché ci sono storie anche molto forti. The first thing that Rio Terra and the prisoners asked for was they wanted a permanent fixture inside of Venice because oftentimes what these projects need is they need access to a larger audience. They need access to funding. They need access to people that care. They need access to people that aren't judging. 
there will be a store that will sell all of the goods that they make in the men's and women's prison and at the same time it'll be a resource center for also the people leaving prison to receive mail to use the computer and just to actually talk with other prisoners that actually have left how they've learned to navigate and enter back into society. L'esperienza e l'incontro con Mark Bradford ci dà la possibilità di far conoscere il progetto che facciamo, di far coinvolgere altre persone ancora e di eh, sviluppare progetti sociali al di là di quello che già oggi facciamo, creando nuove opportunità per i detenuti e per le persone che escono dal carcere e hanno bisogno di trovare un sostegno per riprendere in mano una vita dentro la legalità e nella società. Two weeks ago I, I become a, something like a free person. In prison I see only 10 meters. Now I see more. I see my future. The store uh, is part of my future. Quindi avere l'opportunità e conoscere delle persone che, non so, come Rio Terrao, come Marche, ti danno un'opportunità di dire no, guarda, tu puoi essere ancora importante. E... Non lo so, è tantissimo, cioè non, non ci sono parole per, per spiegare quanto sia importante per noi questo. E per noi è, è la vita, a noi ci danno la vita. Quindi questa è la nostra speranza. Una, un uomo senza speranza che fa amore. Quindi per noi è... Grazie, grazie veramente. There's always going to be people in need. There's always going to be people that are struggling. And even though it's great to be able to do this, to give you access to contemporary art, if we give a little time to people in need, it balances. Everybody can do something, no matter how small it is. So it could be setting up a nonprofit like we did for some other aspects that are needed in a challenged community, wherever that is. Or it could be as simple as volunteering, because I think everybody has something they would jump on. If they could look for it, find it, they would jump on it. There's 12 cooperatives all throughout Italy. I adopted one. It would be great if there were other people that would adopt all 12. Where we begin, isn't necessarily where we have to end up. Our life is not determined before we're born, I don't believe. And I'm a good example of that. And so here we are to support a project that has to do with incarcerated men and women trying to reach for a new life. Making mistakes has to be integrated into the society as the same way as making accomplishments. Caro Mark, scrivere questa lettera non è difficile perché le parole ci escono dal profondo del cuore. Vogliamo ringraziare te e alle persone meravigliose che ci hai fatto conoscere per l'occasione. Tante volte ci si domanda cos'è la felicità. Per noi la felicità più grande è essere considerate in questa triste realtà. Per noi poter lavorare è molto importante. Con una opportunità lavorativa ci sentiamo liberi di scegliere il nostro destino per il futuro. Quella felicità che tu ci hai regalato, desideriamo che la vita lo istituisca a te in ogni momento. Non ci resta che dirti mille grazie di cuore da tutte noi. So, uh, no okay. better than to last the, watch, watch the last minute of that no, in not. order to be able to ask but a you question. Know, you know what the best part about that was? Did you see a lot of the, um, at the opening of the store, there were a lot of the inmates? 
What happened was that both directors of the women's prison and the men's prison believed so much in the project, they allowed, they gave them a day pass, and they were all there. Their families came. I mean, it, it had never happened before because they were so committed and it had really changed kind of the way prison programs could work. And there's a much more of a humanizing, that's why I really wanted to work with the prison population is because the way in which they work with cooperatives there is very different than, than in this country, what happens to people that are incarcerated. And that was, that was the moment that I was so surprised about. When I walked in and saw the people from the project that was still incarcerated, and that piece goes uh, for their uh, PR and their website and um, kind of, they really edited it and developed it and I kind of kept pulling back and pulling back and they wanted, no, we want you in it, we want you in it. So that's- Photogenic. That's but where, but, but the project itself will go on for six years. Um, and they'll have a store, more people leaving prison can work in the store, they can receive mail. It's kind of a, a place to get started. And this is very unprecedented. They haven't had these public, private collaborations before. And um, so I go back one, about twice a year now. I was going back every month. Because if you commit, you have to commit. It's very typical of how you work, that you find something, like here in Baltimore, that's already working instead of coming in saying, I'm gonna tell you what you need and we're gonna start a whole new thing. It's, you find something where people are already doing for themselves, someone who's already had a good idea, and you say, how can we make this sustainable for you? And that's gonna be my contribution. So that's a perfect segue, Katie. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so, Keisha, could I invite you to the stage too, please? Thank you. So for those of you who read the Baltimore Sun, uh, you all have seen yesterday there was a very nice article announcing what the social dimension of our work in Baltimore with Mark is going to become, and our principal partner being um, Green Mount West Community Center, and we're pretty thrilled by it, and we wanted to give you an opportunity first to speak about the good work that you're already doing, because as Katie said, Mark is not the man who swoops in and does his own thing. He enhances the good work that's already been done. So if you could, wouldn't mind sharing with yes, us. Yes, I feel like. Before you start rolling yes. through, you can roll. You, you can yes, roll I know. <laughs> I want to thank, um, also, the, we're not going to bring everybody up, but Noisy Tenants and Seven Crowns, you boys, you, you two stand up, stand up, y'all stand up. <laughs> they are there, they are, they are on the ground doing the work behind the scenes, amazing. Yes. So, and that's part of what we do. We believe in secession. You know, I'm an old head to them and to the young people that we work with, and I know that we can't keep doing this in the way that we're doing it. I love the fact that, you know, Mark talks about, and Chris, about enhancing us, and I like to be enhanced. My hair isn't done today, um, but I, I know, I know. I know. Thank you, Mark, thank you. But, but <laughs> thank you. But it's like when you get those eyelashes on and you have the right outfit, it just makes you, you know, yes, you know, know you're good, but it just takes you to the next level. And that's what I really feel about this experience for us. You know, it's going to take us to the next level, where you walk differently, you sound differently, you act differently. And that's what it's about for us. We started this process of working with the children in Green Mount West. We're very close to Penn Station. Our community, it's a great deal of development of buildings. We have them, they're coming. But the issue is that the people are not being invested in in the same way. And we noticed that we had a large number of young people as well as seniors who people really, you know, if something happened, it was call the police. It was, you know, I'm putting cameras up. And one of the things that, you know, Nick, who lives in our community, you know, said, you know, we got to get out of here and help out. And so we started with doing bus stop buddies, just being at the corner, because a lot of our young people, when they're happy, they're sad, they're mad, they still express that in a violent way in a violent way. And we want them to understand that it's okay to be angry. There's nothing wrong, that's a, that's a healthy emotion. It's about how you're expressing it. 
And so part of our commitment is making sure that we are creating this space in our community, the community center, where these young people, their families, the seniors in our community can know that it is safe. They can be who they are as they're processing. It is not perfect, yet we are just doing the best that we can. And so like I said, this, this feels like that enhancement. This feels like when I'm feeling the best, when I got that red suit on and my eyebrows are done and my eyelashes, that's how I feel. I mean, I may not look it right now, but I'm feeling like that inside. It is real for us. It is real for our community. And, and so we're, we're very appreciative of this. We know that this is transformative. This is transformative on every level. And this is not just about Green Mile West. We want to be a model. We want other people in every community to make this commitment in Baltimore City. I know that when places are, when there are safe places for children to go, when we are making sure that our community is clean, when we are making sure those who want to work have opportunities to work, there is a lessening of crime and violence. And that's what we want. We want a lessening of that. It is not about having more police in the community. That does not cut down violence. It does not, because people know how to navigate that. We believe having programming, having people who are committed, who are consistent, and who recognize what they are great at, and they're willing to bring it in our community. Those are the people we want. So we are extremely, extremely excited about this opportunity. And like we said, we want this to spread throughout our city, wherever there are people who want, who may not even know they need it, that that opportunity is being given. And I am just, like this said, this happened, gosh, I'm getting emotional, please excuse me. <laughs> ooh, ooh. This happened at a moment where everything was going wrong. That's how it started happening. And when we started talking about the pain that we were going through as individuals, that's when stuff started moving for us. And so I think the number one lesson that I've learned is that we cannot be silent about things that we're going through. Because that's what our children's parents are doing. They're silent about it, get out the house. So we had to create a space where they could be, where they could thrive, where they could have fun. We want them to be children. In our community, a lot of adults look at our children as adults. They are children. No matter how they're speaking, no matter how they're gyrating, they are children. And as long as we keep that, to let them go through their process of development, to give them this additional support. You know, we got at least four children who we know are gifted and talented. We know, so it is our responsibility to connect them with the people, with the resources, who will take them to that next level and support them and their families through this process. So we are, as I say, I am just understanding more and more. Silence, silence does not help us to get better. And so I just am recognizing the more I started talking, the better, our, the, the greater the opportunities came. And so that's what I would tell people. Don't think you got to go through this by yourself. You don't. And that's what we want our families to know. That's what we want our children to know. You are not by yourself. We had a mother come to us when we were walking children home, when the bus was late for the whatever amount of time, times. And she says, I am tired. I can't deal with these boys. I'm thinking about sending them away. I need y'all help. And I know that was hard for that mother to do in that moment. And we heard her, and we're doing the best that we can, but we're not enough. And so what this partnership does, it expands the network. Because we cannot do this by ourselves, and we know that. We don't want this center and this space to stay one forever. We need it to grow as our children are growing. So, you know, I'm just ready. We ready. <laughs> Don't play. We ready. <laughs> so, Mark, did, did you want to say a few words about the work that you imagine doing in collaboration with Keisha over the coming well, I'm still years? Keisha. Yeah, I, mean, you don't have to I was enjoying that. Um, you know, 
she keeps saying, uh, we needed you as much as you needed us, and you were ready when the opportunity showed up. It's not like you weren't ready. You right, I know. I you was taught that. Ready. I you was taught ready. that. I was taught so, to be ready. Like, all you guys were yes. Tenants, Our team around, is ready. They were ready. Yes. I, in, I was like, this is a ready crew. They're ready. So, um, and you, and to get ready, you put in the work. You're yeah. still putting in the work. So, um, to me, it just felt, it, you know, the idea just took took wing, took flight. I didn't, we didn't. It just put everybody together, and it took flight. What what comes out of it, I know is going to be positive because I'm going to listen to you, and we're going to build from what you guys, and that's where it'll go. So I don't. Um, I mean, instantly. It just, I walked in, we st and it was just. Yes. So I don't, um, I'm, I'm as ready as you. Yes. And I just want to listen and create the, the sustainable platforms, the architecture around people and young people so that they can build their houses. Yeah. That's the thing that I think I'm really, not, I'm, you know, that's sustainable architecture. If you don't have that foundation, it's very difficult to build a house. It just keeps falling down, falling down. And so that's what, we're, that's what you're trying to do. It's yes. very, very obvious. Yeah. And when I had to go back to school, I had to go back and build that foundation much years later. So I'm right, I feel every single thing you're talking about. And I think um, you guys are ready. We appreciate that, you no, know. No, but you, you don't be. Honey, don't well, we we have a great team. You do. We have, we have a, a great, impressive. great team. We have a great team. Um, they they are very innovative. They share their vision in our space. You know, one of the things I'm a former school administrator. One of the things I wanted to be someone who can motivate and inspire people to do be their best, and I am inspired daily by Seven Crowns and Noisy Tenants. They make me better. The children make me better. And that's what this is about, us consistently getting better and better and better. The better we are, the better our community is. And I was surprised as you guys worked like you were getting paid. Yes, I, I know. Mean, it was amazing. <laughs> and then I started digging in and realizing a lot of it is on volunteer. They ran a whole summer program on volunteers. And that, to me, is an amazing thing because that really shows like how urgent they feel. Yeah. And when you come out, I always say, if you don't have money, you have time. Now, don't tell me you don't have no time and no money. Yeah. I mean, come on now. You know, I'd be writing a check or standing up. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. So um, that really was impressive to me because if you're getting up and you're not getting some coins, yeah. it's coming from a different place. Yeah. And, and so, and for us, it was about you know. Someone recently told me, you know, why don't y'all quit this? And I'm like, quit? No, you don't quit. We made a commitment. Has it been intense personally? Yes. But as you said, Mark, you just got to move through, and that's what helped me day by day. You know, when I had to. I have told everybody now. So I was living off my savings and doing this work and being very engaged in community. Of course, I'm telling everybody you need to save at least two years. Six months is not enough. I'm letting you know right now. Oh, and I, yeah, I know, but that's it's real. <laughs> and during this process of doing this work, my car was repossessed. And I didn't say anything, you know. Then it's like I just had to start talking. I was like, I can't. You can't, you gotta say something. And as soon as I started saying something, the one person I didn't tell was my mother. I waited three months until after I got the car back. And then of course I had to go through that process with her of Keisha, what are you doing? What is this about? And is it worth it? And we're seeing, yes it is. On a daily basis, we see the impact. We see how they are altering aspects of themselves. They are monitoring and controlling their behaviors, not us. And I know it has a lot to do about us being consistent, engaging with them in a positive way on a consistent basis, and having no shame, no judgment about what their families are going through. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the number one thing. We don't go through all that. We need to know all of your information. That's not what it's about for us. We see you in the community. We see you don't have a coat. We're going to find a coat. 
We see that you're hungry, we're gonna make sure you're fed. That's what we're doing. But we know that it is not sustainable when it's just, you know, and Nick was getting married, so I know his family was like, what are y'all doing, you know? You know, so every aspect of this, every aspect of our beings has been put in, so it's no quitting. But there is this end in mind, and it's more about the end in a successional manner of making sure that we're doing everything possible now so that when we're no longer connected, we've already got a team that's coming right up to continue this work and build on it. So that's what this is about for us, creating that foundation of success. Because I know these young people and their families, this is going to be life altering, life altering. And that's what this is about, helping the trajectory of their lives go as far as it can go. Because they're in our space on a daily basis, 30 to 40 every day. <laughs> so it's very clear to me that the four of us could talk all day and almost have talked all day. I think 90 minutes has gone in a heartbeat. But I want to, we have various different mechanisms for people to ask questions. And although we don't have a huge amount of time, we have some. And I would like to give the room a voice. So I know that there are online questions. There are probably some questions on pieces of paper that people have written down. Um, and we do also have microphones. I'm not sure how I'm going to get those questions from the audience, but... Um, so we've been, through, we've been through Mark's life story, we've been through Venice, we've talked about Rio Terra, and we've begun to sketch what um, our engagement with Greenmount Community Center is going to look like. So if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask about any of those things in the short time we have remaining. I think everybody's happy and willing to take them. All right. So there are young people listening at, listening at Morgan um, right, right now at Morgan State. Can you be an artist without knowing your art history? Does it matter in the arts of the 21st century? How do, what is, what, does art matter now only in relation to history, or does art have other possible meanings today? Mark. I guess it's an art question. Well, you know, yes. I think that, the, I think that if, you, if you think about the conversation from getting, stop thinking about objects and thinking about ideas. Yes, and the ideas, because the ideas just become history. But if you look at the time when the artists were doing the work, there was ideas or even belonging to the world, political reasons for doing the work that they're doing. So yes, I do think that, art, that the ideas matter. What comes out of the ideas, and if it's an artwork, that's fine. Uh, they always say, do you think that art can change the world? I think that artists, and the ideas that they generate can change the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that we hope to collaborate with um, on with Keisha is to, to think about the museum as a little bit more of a community center and to make sure that what that's a test we're putting art to. Does it matter? Is it relevant to life? Is, is the museum a little bubble over here? Or is it something we're all thinking about that has big meaning yeah. and not just little tiny meaning? Yeah. A lot of art career advice questions here, which maybe you I could. It offline. Yeah. <laughs> so, are there any questions from the? Any questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. You're going to have to yell. Thank you, that's great. Um, so the one thing is we need people who like children. We really do, you gotta like them. Um, you gotta like them and you have to be willing to share aspects of who you are, something that you know that you're great at. Be willing to be there. And so we need a lot of our children um, value one-on-one -on -one attention. 
And so we really need people who can assist in that capacity, provide academic support and strengthening. We have some strong students. We want to consistently take them to the next level. We have students who are suffering. Their um, literacy rates are low. We know that when your literacy rate is low, there's a high chance for you to be involved in criminal behavior. We want to do everything possible to bring people in who can support them in getting stronger and better. So those people who, number one, like children, know what they do well, and are willing to share it in the community, and helping an academic and providing that one-on-one -on -one attention. Thank you. And if you don't like children, they also need help organizing the books. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But, but we will have you come in when children are not there. <laughs> I think we have one, another question of it. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking everybody on the stage. Um, this question, I think, is for all of you. Baltimore is a relatively small city, um, and the inner city, there are a lot of um, silos that keep us all from coming together. There's a lot of community centers, there's a great deal of art nonprofits that people have been engaged in for many years that are functioning on shoestring budgets. And a lot of people like Tisha are doing the work um, without um, having a platform, without finances. So I'm wondering what is the possibility of all of our arts administrators, our um, arts organizations, our city partners collectively coming together instead of us investing in one community center or one arts organization. I'm wondering because Baltimore is relatively small, what is the likelihood of us actually working and partnering strategically to actually do something to lift up the city of Baltimore? I'm hoping that this partnership does that. I, I'm learning that it's more of a club. And if you're not a part of the club, so it moves just like middle and high school. If you are not a part of the club, if you don't respond in the way people want you to respond, you know, you don't have relevance. You're not invested in. And sometimes it, sh it takes a stronger personality from the outside to have a little swagger, to come in where people, everybody's paying attention to. My hope is that, I hope that there are people in this audience, and we know, I know people, I hope that you're hearing and seeing this, but I'm okay with outside people being a catalyst for change. Because we know what we've done inside. We know who we've reached out to. We know who the people who've ignored us. We know, we're very much aware. We didn't take it personal, we kept on moving. And so to me, I'm hoping that this, this attention because you're right, this is not just about our community. We talk about that all the time. This is not, this is, we want this to be a catalyst for every organization, every institution to say, every community in Baltimore City, if you want it, we are gonna support you, however way that looks. And so we, we don't wanna be, you know, I think about myself as a, as a child, and I wasn't a part of cliques. I understood them, and now I'm seeing how they can be so problematic on a much grander scheme. And that's what we've encountered the clickishness. And if you don't move in a certain way, if you don't do certain things, it's like you're punished, and you're punishing children. That's who you're punishing. And so, you know, this is, you know, my hope is that this is a catalyst for that, moving in a way that works to the best in the possible manner. That's the hope. That really is. And so just from a museum institutional perspective, I would go, so that there's that step within the city of Baltimore. I'd also say that this is new work for museums. So it's a new province of thinking for us to meet a need first and then introduce art as a stimulus. So we're acknowledging that the platform isn't there for the vast majority of people to have that experience within this city. So we're providing uh, you know, a fabric where that can be next for them. I would say that um, it's, it should be understood as a replicable model. That's the concept. So there are many, many, many museums in this country, and a lot of those museums have incredibly well-heeled boards of trustees. The BMA is an incredibly progressive board of trustees that's turned in the direction of doing this kind of work, and I think it's extraordinary and commendable. 
I think what you're going to see is the success of this museum partnering with Keisha and partnering with Mark. And I think other museums around the country are going to think, we too can do this. And so you will see an avalanche of change. But I do think it's important it, strategically to take a small bite to begin with and do it intensely, demonstrate success, and then replicate. Because I don't know that we could have gotten a project bigger off the ground as quickly as we did. And to me, the action part of it feels really, really important. Do something. So I think there's maybe one question back there. I think maybe we have time for two more. Yep. Um, could, could it be possible, would it, would it be a good idea uh, if there's a need for, for the BMA to have a presence in, in every community in, in Baltimore? You know, we have the Enoch Pratt Library. It's really a private city and a model nationally where you have, you know, you have libraries in every community. Um, could, could the BMA be in every community in such a way that the artists in that community could be celebrated and could have kind of their own um, museum but connected with the BMA so that there's that kind of panache, you know, yep. that kind of uh, elevating so um, just two very quick answers to that. First, the young man who just delivered those questions to Katie is actually the person responsible for running our outpost program, Dave Issa. It does extraordinary work all over the city, bringing arts, education, and access to different communities, at big and small, places of great privilege, places of great challenge, up to and including Union Baptist. So we do spread a lot of the good work we do through education to different corners of the city. Um, I'll also say that in terms of our exhibition program, uh, public programs and acquisitions, we have a sort of local global mantra. So obviously Mark is deeply global. Um, we also have artists like Stephen Towns and Amy Sherald in the audience, both of whom we're doing exhibitions with, we're buying work by, and they are both wholly local artists. And I think the great revelation to me about Baltimore and this is quite unlike any city other than Los Angeles and New York, is that the depth of artistic talent here is like nothing I've ever seen outside of those two cities. And so it doesn't involve a compromise in our standards in any way to work with local artists because the work is extraordinary. That is a, and I was never able to say that in Boston. I was not able to say it in Columbus. I haven't been able to say it in any city I've lived and worked in. Um, and there's a particular dimension to it. Um, here, which has to do with formal invention, and it has to do with community action and social justice. That is also a hallmark of Baltimore, and it happens to align perfectly with what we're trying to do as a museum. So, it's of an answer to your question. I hope that we're beginning to do all of that work, um, and we're very committed to it. I think, I think the last question is something that Keisha and, and Mark can both answer, and really both have in, have in common. And this person asks, how will art redirect and focus pain and violence in, in a situation where that pain is um, inherent and systemic. And I guess it's a Keisha question because one of the things that was so striking when, when I first met you, there's so many ways you're like Mark, that you share things, was that how important creativity was for you and talking about what your kids needed, not discipline, not school tutoring, but creativity. So what can it do, both of you? Um, I, I mean, we know it, is, it has a calming effect you know, I'm never, you know, I never was a Play-Doh child. These children create so much with Play-Doh and get mad when we got to put it up. Um, asking when are we buying, I mean, it calms them. It brings them peace. They are able to be still. And I'm like, okay, how do we build on this? When do we bring the clay in? How do we take this to the next level? because we see it, it doesn't matter their age. We'll have a 15-year-old with the Play-Doh, and they are in a quiet, calm space. And I take advantage of quiet and reflection because it's just my life, I know I need that time. I'm recognizing how in those moments, it, they, just get, they just are able to be still, they are able to be quiet, and they're at peace. Well, it depends on um, it depends on what when you kind of are talking. If you're talking about young, like undergrads, that's a, that's kind of one thing. But if you're talking about kind of before they get to art school or talking about just local children, I think that um, 
What's, what always strikes me is that when you give them the tools to use both, both their, their sense of tactileness, their sense of touch, at the same time as their sense of kind of thought process. And that third thing, which, is, which can be so personal, which is their imagination. Mm -hmm. Often times, um, young children have not even been allowed the tools to be still enough to unpack their own toolbox. And when you start to see them unpack their own imagination, it's like watching someone read for the first time. Um, and that's what I always love, is to give them to the tools and the safe space to unpack their imagination. And that can lead to just all kinds of different things. And I think it's the same thing. You are creating that space that they can unpack. And when I say unpack, I mean truly unpack. They might start at like comics and video games, but if they keep unpacking, unpacking, it starts to get more original and more original, and they go deeper, and it becomes something else. And that's when it starts to get kind of interesting. So I think we're officially out of time. Yep. Um, I hope that this audience has absorbed from this incredibly rich discussion a keen sense of what the BMA is trying to become. And so I thank everybody on the stage for helping articulate that. Katie, for making a quick trip from New York. And uh, Keisha, from driving across town. And uh, of course, Mark, who's really our reason to be here, for squeezing us in between Venice and Los Angeles. So thank you. Yeah, just one more hand. Let's just thank them. Just an amazing experience of collaboration. Uh, it, it is what I believe our community is about. It builds on our strength. Uh, you are active participants in this movement. So again, uh, Keisha, Chris, Mark, Katie, thank you. Uh, I believe there's, there, are there some logistic uh, questions? Uh, there's a reception next door. Uh, we're gonna have a mapping exercise in the uh, room remembrance, which is just underneath of here. Uh, is there a need for me to give a benediction? May, may the divine bless you and keep you, smile upon you and keep you safe. Have a great day. <laughs>